We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, 
Call upon Him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as His people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking His grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Trinity is from 2 Samuel chapter 22. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who think that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. Alleluia. Gospel according to St. Luke, 
the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the manager had failed to do his job. He had wasted his master's possessions. His failures and faults were finally coming to a head. There was going to be a day of reckoning. The master was calling him to account, and he knew that he was guilty. So what should he do? He wasn't strong enough to work, and he wasn't about to humiliate himself and go beg for help. But he had to do something, right? So far, so good. We get it. This makes perfect sense. But you know, if you were listening, that the text is about to get really weird and really difficult to understand. Now, it's not hard to understand what happens in the text. That seems clear enough. Since there's no way out of his predicament, the manager decides to call the master's debtors and cancel a significant amount of their debt. Why? Well, to salvage a good name for his master, yes, but also to earn an appreciation in the debtor's minds for himself. It really is a shrewd response to a difficult situation. Some have even called it unjust, or, as our English translation calls him, dishonest. After all, the manager ends up losing a lot of money in the process. And yet, the manager comes and then commends, I'm sorry, the master comes and then commends the manager for his shrewdness. If that weren't weird enough, what makes this most difficult to understand is that Jesus appears to be encouraging us to act in the very same way. Now at this point, too often, attempts to make sense of this parable turn into debates over what the text might mean and how we might apply it. Like this, people debate whether the manager was shrewd or cunning or dishonest or unjust. Because they're trying somehow to justify his actions. Or they'll debate whether or not his actions were really selfish, a way to save face at the last hour, or were a noble attempt uh, to earn a good name for his master. But one thing most people will agree upon is that Jesus clearly does encourage us to be more like the manager. But that doesn't make this any easier to understand if being more like the manager is being more dishonest or even lazy. And Jesus' final words of the text certainly don't encourage us in that direction. You cannot serve both God and money. So what are we to do? Well, rather than considering this text on its own and in isolation from the place in the Gospel of Luke in which we find it, let us look at it in its specific context. For when we do, we will find that the scriptures around this text help us to understand and apply the scriptures in this text. So what came immediately before it? And I don't mean just chapter 15. Yeah, we know that. 15 comes before 16. No, what words came before it? What came immediately before this text are the three parables that Jesus told to the Pharisees and scribes who grumbled when he received sinners and ate with them. The three lost parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, otherwise known as what? The prodigal son. 
Those are the words of Jesus which immediately precede this difficult text of the manager being commended by his master. What is more is that there are two specific and significant verbal parallels between the parable of the prodigal son and the story of this lazy manager which we have before us today. We'll take the first one first. In today's reading, the English translation says that the manager was what? Wasting the master's possessions. The Greek word is diaskorpidzon. The same word, diaskorpidzon, is used in chapter 15, verse 13, when describing how the prodigal son was living when he was going astray. And I know you know that story. You may even remember that we don't usually say that the prodigal son was just wasting the property in reckless living. How does it go? How is it normally translated in our English texts? We say that he what? He squandered the possessions. But it's the same Greek word in both texts. And the point... The point is that the manager's wastefulness in today's text is being put in parallel to the prodigal son's squandering in the previous chapter. The prodigal son, who is as lost as a sheep or a coin, and whose only hope was to place himself at the mercy of the Father, is to be in our minds when we hear the parallel account of what we will now call the squandering servant. Now what this connection does is allow us not to dismiss the seriousness of the wastefulness of this manager wasting his master's possessions. It helps us see that Jesus really does mean what he says. You cannot love both God and money. And that if we mismanage earthly things like money and possessions... That is only indicative of how we will manage the heavenly treasures of Christ and His Word. So let us not debate, but know for sure that there is no encouragement at all in this parable for the faithful to be lazy with the blessings of God. Or to poorly use that which the Lord has given us. Misuse of money or possessions laziness at work, or other ways by which we squander the good gifts which the Lord has given to us make us guilty of being squandering servants who will be called to give an account to our Master. How we manage our families and communicate with our spouses and teach our children. Whether we live beyond our means or are faithful in our stewardship whether we support the ministry of the gospel so that our churches and schools can continue to provide necessary ministries, or whether we chase after worldly pleasures and spend our money accordingly, whether we are lazy at work or earn a good reputation not only for ourselves but also for our employer, whether we begrudge our bosses or seek to serve them, whether we are diligent in our studies working hard and doing our best, or whether we put them off in order to bury our faces in our screens. My preaching, my teaching, my care for the flock, my visitation and administration of the church's affairs, all of this is included in that which we are given by God to manage. And all of this is included in that which we have been guilty of of squandering. So let us all have ears to hear and let us all confess that we are squandering servants. And let us recall once again the context for all of this. Jesus speaks these words about a squandering servant to people who are upset that Jesus is receiving squandering servants and eating with them. 
And it was this mercy of God given so freely to poor sinners that was so beautifully illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son when the father sees that squandering son far off in the distance and runs to him. Yes, he hears his confession, but then he calls him son, offers the sacrifice, and declares a feast for all to celebrate. And do you recall that I said there were not one, but two specific and significant parables, parallels with our text and the prodigal son? Of course, the first was to identify the parallel squandering of which the son and the servant were both guilty. But the other connection? The other connection is the mercy of the master. The father showed mercy to the son who had squandered his possessions in the previous parable. Now in today's text, it is a master who has mercy on the manager who also had what? Squandered his possessions. The point is that the solution in both parables is not found in what the squandering son or servant were able to do to go rectify their situation. Go out and make things right. No. In both parables, there was nothing either one could do. Rather, the solution was found only in the mercy of the Master, who in both parables reveals the character of God whose mercy is revealed in Jesus. Sure, the squandering manager is guilty. And of course, there is nothing he can do to make things right, but his guilt ought not paralyze him. For he knows that he serves a master who is merciful. And so the actions which are sometimes called shrewd are really best seen as actions which are carried out as a person trusts that his master will indeed be merciful. (laughs) So guess what? The parable isn't about the squandering steward any more than the prodigal son is about the son. They're both about the Lord who receives sinners and eats with them. (laughs) They're both about the mercy of the Lord extended to those who are in way over their heads. And it is this mercy of the Lord which enables even guilty sinners to act without fear and in great freedom. Whether you are a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker. Whether you are a teacher in our school, a pastor of Christ's church, a farmer, a plumber, a nurse, or some other kind of worker. You are not called to your vocation and to be a steward of the Lord's good gifts because of something that you have done. Some righteousness of your own. But on the other hand, nor has your mismanaging of God's gifts nullified the call of God which you have received. Rather, regardless of your God-given vocations, and even as one who has squandered God's gifts, you were called in mercy. And by the gospel of Jesus Christ, You are free. Jesus died in your place. He took all your sin and your squandering and your mismanaging of the Lord's good gifts and he took it upon himself and buried it in the tomb. And yet there he was, risen and victorious over the grave so that you would not be paralyzed by your sin but freed by his life to live knowing always in Christ that God is merciful. So, be freed, like that squandering servant in the parable, to trust that God will be merciful and then act in that mercy. Like when you and your spouse are at odds with years 
of failures and faults and words which have done damage, threatening to separate what God has joined together with both husband and wife buried under a pile of regret with no possible way to make things right? I've seen it a hundred times. Husband and wife are in my study and there's no way that they can list it all. They're buried under a pile of sin. Or when your families have feuded for decades and there's no way that the, that, that the right can make, that you can right the wrong. Or whenever you find yourself in a predicament with your spouse or your children or your parents or your friends at work, in school, or even here within the body of Christ. When you have mismanaged the Lord's good gifts, you're buried under your burdens. There's plenty of guilt to go around and there's no possible way that you can fix it on your, on your own. Dear people of God, in all of these situations, the answer is the same. Live as children of the light. Act in mercy. Cancel the debt of your debtor. Forgive your spouse. Forgive your neighbor or even your enemy just as God in Christ has forgiven you. What do you have to lose? What do you have to gain? A good reputation not only for you, but also for the name of the Lord in whom you give that mercy. You will never be commended for squandering the Lord's good gifts, but relying on his mercy and acting according to it will bring about God's praise and extend his blessings to those who receive his mercy through you. For we are all squandering servants. But we know that the Lord is merciful. And His mercy is the thing that will enable us to also live in mercy so that His name, the name of our Master, Jesus Christ, would be glorified among us in our families, in our school, and in the whole community. In the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, I want to invite all of our Sunday school teachers forward uh, to be installed again as the new year kicks off of Christian education. Please come forward. Everybody's going to end up on the same side. All right. <laughs> Very good. Dear brothers, dear brother and sisters in Christ, you are to be installed as Sunday school teachers at Trinity Lutheran Church, a work in which our Father in heaven has great joy. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Beloved in the Lord, you are to assist me, the minister of word and sacrament, in the instruction of God's people according to his holy word. You are to prepare yourselves for this work by your individual and corporate study of the Word of God and the faith drawn from it as it has been delivered to us in the small catechism. While holiness of life and obedience to Christ are expected of all the members of the congregation, 
It is especially important that you show yourselves by word and example to be faithful to him in service and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the position entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties, trusting in the Lord and conforming yourselves to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, then answer, I do. Now to the congregation, beloved in the Lord, you have heard the promises of faithfulness spoken by this man and these women. Do you promise to support them in their work, to remember them in your prayers, and to work with them to the best of the abilities that God has given you, so that he may be glorified and his work be done in our midst? If so, then answer, we will. Brother and sisters in Christ, I install you as Sunday school teachers at Trinity Lutheran Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and merciful God, enlighten and strengthen you in your service, that you may be good and faithful leaders and teachers to the glory of his name and the salvation of his people. Let us pray. O Lord, Grant to these, your people, the gifts of wisdom and discretion, kindness and faithfulness, so that they may effectively teach and guide, and grant to all your people a ready willingness to learn. Let the knowledge of your word be preserved and extended among us, so that all may know and praise you now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Thank you for your service, Jason. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service, brother. In a moment, we will gather our hearts in prayer for the prayer of the church. I just have one brief announcement. There will be others after the service. I've been asked to remind us that those uh, attendance cards in the pews are there for you to fill out, and we do want to Uh, and encourage you to use those as you're able. There's the card for the guest and then the card for the members, one per family. Fill those out, and then as the offering is collected, you can pass them to the center, and the ushers will pick them up. They really do help us keep track and, and, and care for our people. We now gather our hearts in prayer. Please stand. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the priesthood of all the baptized, that they would be humble and merciful, faithful in their vocations, and grateful for the salvation they have in Christ Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Lord of the harvest to fill his vineyard of grace with faithful workers that his means of grace would be available to sinners in need the world over. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our synod president, Lee, our district president, Jeremy, our circuit visitor, Alan, Tyler, and Gregory, our pastors in Cole Camp, and all pastors in Christ, that they would preach the gospel in its purity and administer the sacraments according to Christ's institution. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all our schools, especially the preschools, day schools, high schools, colleges, and seminaries of our synod, as well as our own Lutheran School Association, that they be places where truth and virtue are believed, taught, and confessed, and all that is said and done, to the benefit of the faculty, staff, students, and the entire community. And also that we appreciate and give thanks for 20 years of teaching ministry for Barb Schnackenberg at our Lutheran School Association. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the strength to resist the temptations that assault God's children 
especially the temptations to indulge in sexual immorality or to be overcome with the love of money, that they would repent where they have fallen prey to these temptations and with God's help strive to be chaste and content. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a faithful prayer life among God's children, that they would call upon the Lord when in need, give thanks for the provisions he provides for body and soul, and praise him in everything. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For good government among us, that we might live in freedom and peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those experiencing physical afflictions at this time, especially Darren, Dean, Dorothy, Gage, Delbert, Beverly, Grace, Larry, David, Rudy, Pat, Alyssa, Wilfred, Denise, Raymond, and Chelsea, that they would be delivered from every trouble and strengthened in their faith, let us pray to the Lord. For women with child, especially Lauren, Amanda, Eliza, and Trish, that they be given strength and their children preserved through pregnancy, birth, and new birth and holy baptism, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We stand. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, And with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for and ever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, the body of Christ, amen, the blood of Christ shed for you, amen,
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. morning. Got a few announcements. Uh, in the misprint in the bulletin, the junior youth met last night. And uh, if you have newsletter articles, need to get them tomorrow by Friday. Uh, the fair stand schedules is out there on the table if you would pick one up. And uh, opening chapel this week on Wednesday is at 835. They'd like everyone to come that would like to. And uh, the 20, 125th anniversary committee, if you'd like to be on that, let the pastor know and at the office, and uh, they'll get your name on the list. Thank you. 